James, for those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we might be talking about today. Sure. My name is James Broll, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. My research primarily focuses on regulatory reform. How do states or the federal government create rules? How do they uh, analyze rules to see that whether they're effective or how do they go about reviewing their regulations? And as part of this research, I've begun to do some work on pharmacy reform. Too many rules or not enough rules? That's kind of a difficult question to answer. So at Mercatus, we've developed some ways of measuring how much regulation gov different governments produce. Um, so it turns out actually that for a long time, economists haven't really had very good measures of regulation. And even, even today, a lot of the measures are pretty imperfect. Um, as you can imagine, there's thousands of different requirements on the books. They're doing a lot of different things. Uh, how do you go about ascertaining how much there is essentially. And so historically we've used metrics like counting pages um, or looking at the federal register, which is a daily publication that has all kinds of things in it, not just regulations. It also has notices about hearings or meetings or that the uh, regulatory agency is taking comments or things like that. So people have done things like count pages or look at how many employees are working at agencies. Um, but at Mercatus, we've developed some metrics to analyze the administrative codes that different governments produce. So these are the, the compilations of all the rules in the books, and they could be about pharmacy requirements. They could be about anything, environmental regulations, financial regulations. Now, a typical administrative code is really too large for an individual to read. Mm from start to finish. So for example, the code of federal regulations has about 180,000 pages in it. Wow. So if you just read that for 40 hours a week at a normal pace of reading, it would take you about three years wow. to read. <laughs> Is anybody expected to read that? Well, there's a lot of attorneys <laughs> who make a lot of money trying to understand right. all these requirements or influence what goes in these rules. But I think I think often what happens is people try to find the regulations that are most relevant to their industry or sector. And, and then there are trade associations and groups like that, whose job it is to help inform various industries that this regulation's coming, it's going to affect you. Gotcha. But for research purposes, which is more where my interest is, historically, it's just been really hard to make sense of all these different requirements. And when economists tended to look at rules, they would just look at them one at a time. They'd say, let's do a cost benefit analysis for this particular air pollution regulation or this particular sure. securities regulation. But that's there's three or 4,000 rules finalized every year. So you can't do that for every regulation. That's just federal requirements. We developed some tools at Mercatus to analyze administrative rules using text analysis technology and machine learning. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we're doing is scanning through administrative codes using computer programs mm. and searching for words that could signify requirements of various kinds or words that could be relevant to whatever industry is being targeted by regulations. Um, and we can combine some of these metrics to produce estimates of how regulated various sectors hmm. of the economy are. And we produced data uh, looking at the federal regulatory code, looking at state regulatory codes, and even looking at some other countries. I was listening to some of your stuff earlier, James, and some of those words are like shall and must mm -hmm. and those kind of things. Those are all like indicative of a, a regulation, basically. Right, so we, we look for words like shall, must, may not, prohibited, required, words that can signify requirements of various kinds or mandates or prohibitions. Those words can obviously signify other things like definitions, this, this term shall mean this and that, or, uh, or they can apply to public sector civil servants, like sure. the administrator must do this or that. Um, but for the most part, they, te they tend to actually relate to requirements. And so we're 
we're getting better at measuring regulation and that's ultimately going to help us improve our understanding of what the effects of regulation are. Yeah, it's interesting because I heard you're talking about Alaska versus California. And Alaska has like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand and California's was like (laughs) by half a million or something like that. So at the state level, the average state has about 135,000 regulatory restrictions. So instances of these five terms that I mentioned, Uh, but California has about 400,000. And Idaho is actually the least regulated at about 39,000. Um, Alaska, I'm, I'm, I think it was somewhere in the 40 to 50,000 range. I don't remember off the top of my head. So it's on the lower end too. Who cares about the number of regulations and why do they care? There's a few reasons why we care. One is that over time, the amount of regulation is incre- has been increasing hmm. over the last eight decades, say by pretty much any measure, whether you're going by sure. page counts, number of agencies, staff, budgets, restrictions, words, the amount of regulation seems to be going up. From an academic perspective, I think we're, we're trying to understand, well, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What is, that? what is the consequence of that? It's also, from a democratic standpoint, it could be important because it seems as though over time, more lawmaking power has moved from our elected representatives, say in Congress or in state legislatures, to these uh, executive branch regulatory bodies. Typically, a law comes out, and then from that law, they say, well, in order to make this law true, we have to have these rules set up. Because you don't vote on every rule, it's the larger decisions. And then the administrative rules would come in and make rules for that. But that's where those can almost take over or do more than the primary decision. Is that even close? That's right. So we typically think of the story of how a bill becomes a law. And we think about our elected representatives in Congress get together, they negotiate something, they pass, they pass a bill, they introduce a bill first, debate it, passes House and the Senate, and then the president signs it. Now it's the law. Well, that's often where the story kind of ends. But Mm -hmm. if you're a regulation researcher like me, that's actually where the story begins. Mm. Because these laws called statutes delegate certain additional lawmaking powers to to regulatory bodies. They're tasked with implementing the law, with executing the law. And like you say, they allow them to make like little laws underneath the bigger law. It's supposed to all fit together, but... Right. So in order for a regulator at, a, at the Department of Labor or Department of Health and Human Services to write a regulation, they need to be granted some uh, authority from, from hmm. Congress through a statute. Um, but that authority can be very narrow. It could say a Department of Health and Human Services, or you have to... Um, pass a regulation that requires calorie counts on main news or something like that. Pretty narrow. But even within that, there's a lot of ways you could do that. Or it could be very broad. It could say, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, you have to set air pollution standards for certain pollutants within a range that's protective of public health. That's pretty broad. And so in some cases, regulatory agencies can regulate for decades, really. Um, without any additional authorities from one one piece of legislation that Congress passes that delegates them a lot of power. So we're we're interested in the volume of regulation because we're interested in the effects of it. We're interested in um, the implications, I guess, for our democracy. And ultimately, we care about what happens to real people on the ground who are just going about their daily lives and are consumers of products that are regulated and have risks associated with them, but also there's regulations impose costs. So is, are we getting the balance right? Um, and these are the kinds of questions I'm interested in. All right. So James, I followed your background from being a rock star <laughs> <laughs> and then deciding that studying some economic books and so on while you were not yet in college thinking of going forward and then kind of falling in love with the same gusto of economics that you had with music. But how does pharmacy fit into that then? Once you got your 
degree and then PhD. Where does pharmacy enter into this? So this interest began, I guess, about two years ago. So I was following a regulatory reform that was happening in Idaho uh, hmm. very carefully. And most people aren't, aren't aware of this, but Idaho had a, a major regulatory reform effort that happened in 2019. And you said Idaho was the, one of the lowest ones or the lowest one. Idaho is currently the least regulated state by the Mercatus reg data metric count. Yeah. I think at the time it was fourth or fifth least regulated uh, before these reforms happened, but so mm. it subsequently become the least regulated. Wow. So basically what happened is Idaho has kind of a unique system where their entire regulatory code has to be reauthorized each year by the legislature there. So this is called a sunset provision. So, and the sunset provision says on July 1st, the administrative code will expire unless the legislature reauthorizes it for an additional year. Uh, this, this law was passed, I think, in the 90s. And until 2019, it had never been exercise the the legislature always reauthorized the code sometimes they made changes or they amended particular regulations while through this reauthorization process but they always passed a reauthorization law it was just a gimme yeah just kind of a gimme the legislature is very involved in rulemaking in idaho and other areas so i'm i'm not sure that this part of their process uh was necessarily the most important part of their process but it was an interesting characteristic of Idaho's rulemaking procedures. And so in 2019, there was some infighting between the House and the Senate. They were both controlled by the same party, by Republicans, but they were debating a particular regulatory reform proposal, and they couldn't come to an agreement on it. And so basically the session ended and they didn't pass this reauthorization bill, which they're supposed to pass every year. <laughs> They basically said all of our regulations are just in limbo now because we weren't able to agree to it again. Right. The reauthorization bill got tied up in this in this other fight that was going on. And so the session ended in April, I believe it was, and the rules were all set to expire in July. And the, the state legislature just went home. <laughs> yeah. So essentially what this did, it didn't mean all the regulations in Idaho disappeared. But gotcha. what it did mean was that the governor of Idaho, whose name is Brad Little, essentially had an opportunity to decide which regulations he wanted to keep and which ones he wanted to let expire. Now, interesting. he couldn't let everything expire because there's a lot of statutes in place that require certain rules to be there. Yeah. So he had to work within those constraints. But essentially, his administration did a very rapid review of all their rules but like you said, rapid is, is relative because even though it's Idaho with the fourth or fifth lowest, to really review this would really take forever to do. So it was a review, but even that has to be probably taken lightly. That's right. They did allow a significant amount of their regulations to expire. I think it was maybe 10% of their rules and it was a higher percentage of chapters, like 25 or 30 percent, but the, but some of the chapters were very small. So it wasn't necessarily the environmental title or something. So most of what actually expired was fairly uncontroversial. They didn't take this as an opportunity to rewrite really controversial regulations, but it was an opportunity to rewrite rules in simpler language, reduce hmm. fees in some cases, eliminate some licenses, simplify text just by making rules shorter, easier to hmm. follow. And so this all happened over the span of a couple months. And the governor then reproposed a new administrative code, essentially. The old code expired. They proposed a new one, uh, put it in place as emergency regulations. Hmm. And so that, that created kind of a seamless transition. And then the legislature returned and eventually got to debate the new rules that had been subsequently enacted. So I actually went out to Boise while this was all going on uh, and met with some of the people that were leading this review effort. Why? Why did you go out there? Did someone hire you guys at that point or you just went out there out of interest? I was invited uh, by the, the Little administration, um, but I wasn't hired in any capacity. Gotcha. I was just a researcher of regulatory reform efforts. And sure. I think they sure. were like, 
they thought, hey, you'd be interested in what's going on here. Sure. So I went out there and I met with some of the individuals who were in charge of the review and some of the regulators. And the head of the reform effort there is an individual named Alex Adams, who he works at the budget department, essentially. He's the budget director, kind of like the OMB director at, in Washington. So he had been leading this review effort, and he's actually a pharmacist. And so he said, you know, James, you should come with me to one of our pharmacies in Boise. And he, he brought me to a pharmacy and showed me how they could conduct certain tests uh, for a flu or strep throat or something like that and prescribe if need be based on results of those tests. They had a menu of different services like this that were available prices, uh, things you, you don't even always see in a doctor's office. Sure. And I was... I was really impressed. I thought this was really interesting. And he, he said, yeah, we've had these regulatory reforms over the last few years that have basically allowed, have expanded the scope of what pharmacists are allowed to do in Idaho. And so I ended up, uh, when I returned back to the Washington, D.C. area, um, which is where Mercatus offices are, I started looking into this and I ended up writing a paper about Idaho's regulatory reforms in the in the area of pharmacy. When you saw this stuff, was this something pretty novel that Idaho had done? And in your mind, was it because of lower regulations that they had more freedom that this opened up? Or what was the genesis of the pharmacist having more freedom and more of a role? Was it the idea that there's not as many regulations and rules. And can I make the jump to say, well, that's kind of an answer why regulations and rules can get overbearing? It's certainly the case that uh, there's a lot of restrictions in place that prevent pharmacists from doing things like giving you a test or prescribing you anything. Um, I, I didn't realize in, at the time when I was in Idaho just how different its regulatory environment is for mm. the practice of pharmacy compared to other states. Uh, when I started looking into this and talking to people in the industry, they said, oh, yeah, Idaho is in this league of its own. They're totally doing mm. they're, uh, in a, just They just have, have gone in a completely different direction. And so that really piqued my interest as well. I mean, in, mo in most states, it's, it's, it's kind of a precautionary regulatory regime. It says basically everything is not allowed unless a law is passed that allows a pharmacist to do something like offer a test or, or prescribe something. So in, in some cases, you might have a law passed that says a pharmacist can prescribe birth control or a pharmacy, a pharmacist can prescribe an EpiPen medication or something like that, or tobacco cessation product, but it'll be one law at a time. And that's actually how Idaho's reform started in the early 2010s. They started passing a law here, allowing for a, a particular product like that to be prescribed, a law there. I'm not sure I have, a, I, I know exactly why they ended up uh, taking much bigger steps. Um, but what ended up happening in subsequent years is in part, it may just be because they got tired of having these battles year after year over single laws, but they basically delegated much broader authority to the Board of Pharmacy. Initially, this is what happened. They said, the legislature said, uh, Board of Pharmacy, you can authorize that pharmacists can prescribe anything within certain categories. Like if there's a low risk test that pharmacists can identify the illness with, these are called CLIA wave tests. Um, if, if, it's a, if it's a mild Ill illness, if it's an emergency, if it doesn't require a new diagnosis, these are there are certain broad categories. And so then the, the Board of Pharmacy started passing lots of regulations saying pharmacists can prescribe medication for mild coughs or um, certain allergy medications and things like that. Then what ended up happening is in 2019, the legislature passed a law that essentially said anything that fits within those categories is allowed by default. Um, unless 
the, the legislature or the Board of Pharmacy expressly prohibits it. So if we already made one rule on this, any other similar rule is going to is going to be authorized, that anything that's close. Right. So the the categories are if if it's a if it doesn't require a new diagnosis, the illness is minor and self-limiting. If it doesn't if it if you can identify it using a low risk test or if the patient's in immediate danger. So those four broad categories uh, basically a, a pharmacist can prescribe within that. Doesn't mean they can prescribe controlled substances or yeah. you know oxycontin or something like that. That doesn't fit in those categories. But low risk medications uh, for minor ailments, essentially, you could walk into a pharmacy, very often get a test for it, and get a prescription all in one stop. And that's unique in Idaho. This information is probably going to be new for a lot of pharmacists like me that are not in the state legislature. But most states, there's probably already either a pharmacy legislator or somebody who's got the ear of a legislator that they want this to happen. And I'm sure that's been going on for a while. So we talked a little bit about what got out of the way in Idaho, but what is in the way of most states of this happening? I imagine it's the AMA doctors and, and there's probably a lot of people that are stopping this. It's not like it's being stopped just because people said, oh, I never thought of that before. I'm sure it's being stopped by someone. Is that fair? I think that's fair. So there's there's certainly some uh, pretty ferocious <laughs> battles that happen among interest groups very often. Anytime you right. start trying to relax re requirements like these and the AMA and med you know, physicians are very often opposed to relaxing some of these restrictions on pharmacists and the pharmacy groups are very often in favor of them. I think it's fair to say that the power of the physicians groups might explain why, in part, why these regulations are there to begin with. Um, and, and pharmacists as, a, as an industry maybe have grown in influence in recent decades that may start to may explain why some of these restrictions are starting to change. At least maybe relative to AMA groups and so on. Maybe the percent of dominance has, well, you know, frankly, I think in medicine in general, people always just kind of bow down to the physicians and kind of got out of the way. And maybe afterwards they said, oh, shoot, we should have done this or that. But I think now there's enough people standing up to say we at least we're going to have nice, productive arguments to see where things should land. I think as new research has become a, a available, we've gotten better at understanding whether relaxing these kinds of requirements is it lead to public health problems, is it not? Um, as states of like Idaho are experimenting with it, are we seeing any problems? Right. So that's one source of friction. Then we, then there are just general constraints in terms of healthcare costs being very expensive, states and right. households having limited budgets. And I think policymakers are looking for ways to increase the supply of healthcare services and maybe bring down costs. Right. Um, and one way to do that is to allow more medical professionals to practice within their uh, uh, training and abilities. So James, with Mercatus then, do you guys find yourself, even if not on purpose, do you find yourself choosing sides and then you end up getting hired by groups that are trying to do more of this or on purpose, do you try to stay way back and just observe? So first of all, of all, I'm not hired by anyone. I just um, I just produce research at a nonprofit that's affiliated with George Mason University. So sometimes you're not hired by what? Well, I'm not hired by legislators. I'm not hired by trade groups. I don't take money from any of those people. You're hired by Mercatus, but not by these other people. Gotcha. Now I will consult with policymakers, um, and I. I sometimes travel to state capitals, especially during the before mm. the pandemic when we traveled more. But yeah, um, and and we'll testify on occasion if a if a bill 
relevant to one yeah. of these kinds of topics comes up. So I do research and I try to get that research into the hands of people who can yeah. use it. And I try to inform policy in that sense, but I'm not lobbying for or against particular legislation. I heard before that government was supposed to go slowly. Maybe I got that from watching Hamilton or something where someone said it was supposed to be a lot of this slowness. It's it's a protection. It costs a whole lot of money, but there's maybe some protection in this slowness. And so from what you saw then in Idaho, I don't know, personally, do you, would you like to see more of that or was that too quick? Well, I think their reforms in Idaho are, are looking pretty prescient right now, especially, I, I didn't know when I was in the, out there in 2019 that a pandemic was going to hit the country in essentially, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. It wasn't just the prescribing regulations. They also made it easier if you had a license from another state to practice pharmacy in Idaho. They enacted telepharmacy reforms, which essentially said a pharmacist doesn't always have to be on site at a particular location. Uh, for that pharmacy to be in operation, they can consult with patients over a video platform, for example. Um, and in, and that led to new pharmacies opening up in some really hmm. rural parts of Idaho. Yeah, right. Um, and all these kinds of uh, kind of changes. They also they also have are very liberal in terms of allowing testing and hmm. and, and prescribing and vaccinating. Hmm. So now. All, during the pandemic, we've seen lots of regulations waived in, in states all over the country and at the federal level to, to allow for testing, to allow for vaccinating, to allow for out-of-state licenses to be accepted, telehealth. These are all things that Idaho did before the pandemic. They look pretty smart in retrospect. So it seems to me that because the sky hasn't fallen in Idaho and it doesn't appear to be falling in states that have been experimenting with these changes during the pandemic, at the very least, states should conduct a review of these rules to see whether they still make sense or where there's it's time for some changes. I, I agree with you that our our system of governance in general is pretty slow to evolve. And, and in some ways that can be good. It doesn't mean there's radical disruptive change that's happening every mm. week. Uh, but it also means we can kind of lock in a status quo that may not be the best of all possible worlds. And so we can make improvements on the margins. Um, I think in general, the biggest problem I see when I look across the country at the regulatory environment, both, both at the federal level and in the states, is just we don't have very good systems in place to course correct and to learn from uh, learn from experience. So we put it, we issue lots of regulations. They're usually not really analyzed uh, up front before right. they're put in place. So someone has an idea, they do something, it's put in place. And then we don't have good systems for reviewing those rules to determine whether they're working. And so the rules tend to just stay in effect. Um, and we don't have much information about what they're doing. And then every year we add more rules. Um, and so the rules, the rule book just tends to grow over time. Is the reason why rules aren't looked at, is there a legal reason for it? Or is it more just like, oh, guys and gals, we just looked at that damn thing last year. Let's, we fought so much and it, there were so much problems with it. Let's not open this can of worms up again. Are there any rules behind a rule being set and then not being opened up again? Or is it just like, we're not going to tackle that again? That's a pain in the ass. It's, it's a little bit of both. Ah, Every state and the federal government have something called an Administrative Procedure Act. Mm. And that sets up the process for creating administrative rules. And these... APAs, uh, these laws, t tend to have a lot of requirements up front. Hmm. The agency has to take comments from the public. Uh, you have to issue a notice. You have to collect information. You have to have a hearing. Um, you have to do economic analysis in some cases. At the state level, it's not really very rigorous. At the federal level, it can be rigorous, but it only happens with a very small number of rules. Then once a rule goes into effect, that's pretty much it. 
Um, the, the procedures for reviewing rules just have never gotten to be as detailed for whatever reason. It sounds like getting a rule in place in the first place is a pain with all the stuff you just mentioned. And then they don't write review in there. So I can see why they would just sit there forever. And so this gets at the second part of your question, which is there's not a, much of a constituency for reviewing regulations. There are these battles that happen up front between industry and various advocacy groups and the regulatory agency and uh, each advocate on behalf of their own interests. Rules come out of a negotiation process. Maybe not everyone's happy, but once the rule's in place, industry complies with it, spends whatever resources they have to to do that. And then at that point, everyone's kind of like, all right, we don't want to fight that battle again. Um, and so there isn't, even if that regulation isn't necessarily accomplishing its goals and isn't necessarily um, advancing whatever, whatever it was intended to or promoting the public interest, there's not really an interest group there to say, we need this regulation reviewed. <laughs> Um, cause the biz business community will say, we already complied. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to revisit this. <laughs> if you open the thing up again, a year later, you're going to maybe move something a half a percent. It's just not worth it. And the people that wanted to in the first place, they know about where they're going to land. Everybody knows about where they're going to land. And it's just not probably not worth moving that again or opening that up again. It's not worth it from the standpoint of those interest groups. It may be worth it from the standpoint of the public at large. Gotcha. Who everybody in, if, you know, if you have 300 million people and everybody's spending a couple bucks. Right. Extra complying, you know, in, indirectly through because of some regulation, it may very well be in the public's interest to revisit the rules, but there isn't an incentive for the public to organize and lobby on behalf of their interests the way that some of these narrow constituencies have an interest in doing that. <laughs> the people, once I got to the top, they were going to be sure to get about what they could out of that. It's kind of like real estate agents, you know, the real estate agents getting like 3% or whatever each side for your house. They want to sell your house. They want the 3%. They want to know if your house is going to sell for a hundred thousand or 300,000. But once they get that all figured out and they work through that, they don't care at the very end whether it sells for 297 or 300. They don't care. They'd rather take 3% on something quickly because at the end it just doesn't move that much. And I can see that with these guys too. Once the interest groups get kind of what they want, a little bit here or there doesn't matter that much, but it sure as hell matters for the 3 million people that are going to be affected. Right. Um, so sometimes this is referred to as the concentrated benefits dispersed costs phenomenon, which is associated with a political scientist. His name's Mansur Olson. Um, and he taught, he just, he had some theories of interest group dynamics. And you can also point to the Federalists papers and Madison and uh, talking about factions and how they tend to kind of gain control over our governance systems. And it's, it's really the same idea. It's that there are these narrow groups that it's not that costly for them because they're small to organize and lobby on behalf of their own interests. It's much more costly for the public at large to organize on behalf of its own interests. Um, and so sometimes the interests of the interest groups align with the interests of the public at large, but not always, obviously. And so that's one of the main challenges with regulations is just that once the interest groups have kind of agreed to a particular course of action and everyone's on board and a, the negotiation's been worked out, it's hard to move the, the needle from that point in any other direction. And so then you're kind of stuck with the status quo for better or worse. If you were an independent pharmacist and you just heard what we were talking about, would you be encouraged by what you're hearing about these special groups not being able to move stuff once it's set? Or would you say, hey, I could do a lot. I could become a leader there and I could make changes. What do you see? Would you be encouraged or discouraged from some of the things that you see maybe outside of Idaho? I guess long run, I'm optimistic. I do think that over long periods of time, 
we learn what works and what doesn't and research is conducted and uh, a consensus emerges on certain issues. I think occupational licensing is actually one of these issues where we're starting to see consensus emerge and we could talk about that, but, and change happens. Hmm. I, I think it's slow. And to the extent that your listeners want to get involved and talk to your state board of pharmacy about problems in the legal system that you're dealing with, bring these examples to their attention. I think there are good people working at regulatory agencies. They want to do the right thing. And so I would encourage people to get involved. But the institutions we have, like we like we said, are slow to evolve. And that's it's not just in government. It's just kind of true of humanity in general. Things don't change that fast. <laughs> Some pharmacists will hear about Idaho and they'll want to speed things up. You know, they'll want to get things moving. However, you also have to watch your tail, watch who's coming up behind you, because there's also legislation that could say pharmacists aren't needed for this anymore. You know, we're going to take every drug in a pharmacy that is under the jurisdiction of a pharmacist, clear that all off. And we're just going to have pharmacists are just going to be in control of controlled drugs, for example. You know, I mean, there's legislation that could speed up and it could hurt a lot of people, too. Right. Absolutely. So economists talk about a, a phenomenon called creative destruction. And this is associated with a famous economist named Joseph Schumpeter. And what it means is that the process of innovation is actually very destructive in many ways. In order to create a new industry, sometimes it means toppling down other industries. And that means disruption for the people that work in those industries. It can mean you lose your job. Um, it can mean people's lives are upended. Um, and so I think one of the reasons we have restrictions like we've been talking about in place is that individuals and industries want them there to keep things kind of stable and predictable. Um, but the consequence of that means is less innovation. Right. It's coming from both sides. Mm -hmm. So there's a trade off. Do we want stability and predictability or do we want innovation and growth and ultimately rises in living standards? But that a long run rise in living standards can mean to short run disruptions that are not pleasant for a lot of people. We're probably seeing a lot of that in the uh, not the same thing, but with the whole taxi thing, you know, the whole token stuff and all that. It's like rules change this way and that way can pretty quickly wipe some things out. That's a perfect example. So taxi medallions in New York City. I used to live in New York. I think they were selling for $2 million or something at the, the peak. Yeah. So imagine right. uh, then Uber comes along and wipes out the value of your, your medallion. So you can, you can imagine a lot of people are pretty upset by that. Right. But at the same time, a lot of consumers benefit from uh, having a much cheaper ride. Yeah, really. Um, we didn't have Uber when I lived in New York. Yeah. And those those cabs, I remember how expensive they were in the livery cabs too. So, Speaking about some of these things that pharmacists kind of have to watch their back on, you know, it could be that in a pharmacy that a pharmacist wants more authority to do this or that. Well, then they're probably also watching their back, not only from other industries, but maybe even from people coming up in the same industry. Let's take, for example, doctors, I'm sure, have to be careful about what they allow physician assistants to do because they probably really make their day a lot better. But if they don't watch it, they could make their life a lot worse, probably. Same with pharmacy. So pharmacy technicians, for example, they're doing a lot in pharmacy, but I imagine there's rules around that where pharmacists want to probably have a pretty tight leash on them before they would open up too much for them. Yeah. So there are regulations in place affecting pharmacy technicians. Um, so pharmacy technicians are the assistant staff at pharmacies who can handle all kinds of responsibilities, filling prescriptions, uh, doing inventory or billing. Um, but sometimes they take on uh, more complicated tasks like compounding medications or doing tests or even vaccinations. Yeah. Um, and so there are restrictions in place that limit both what the, the technicians can do 
and, and in some cases limit the number of technicians that can work in a pharmacy at a given point in time. A pharmacist business might want a hundred techs doing something with one pharmacist. And with technology now, there's probably some arguments where that could happen. What are you guys seeing on that with the ratios and so on? A number of states, more than half of them, impose some kind of ratio requirement on pharmacy technicians, saying that a, a licensed pharmacist working in the pharmacy may not oversee more than X number of technicians, and sometimes interns are included in this as well at a given time. Those ratio requirements tend to range from about one to two to one to six or one mm. to eight at the high end. Uh, but 22 states don't have a ratio requirement uh, as of 2020. So a lot, a number of states don't have this requirement. Um, so I, I think these, re these restrictions are interesting because first of all, we don't, we don't typically think of saying to a physician, you may not oversee more than three nurses. That's not there usually. That's not there usually, Interesting. no. So we usually just trust their professional judgment. Now, there are restrictions in place that say maybe in order to do this task or perform this kind gotcha. of service task sure. or test, only a physician can do it, not a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. There are lots of restrictions like that. Gotcha. But, but not these ratio requirements, which are somewhat unique to the pharmacy setting. They're a little unusual. So... In 2016, 18 states did not have a ratio requirement, and now that, as of 2020, that's up to 22. So it, it appears that some states have been moving away hmm. from these restrictions, but more than half of the states still have some kind of ratio requirement like this in place. Uh, some states have been waiving these restrictions during the pandemic. Um, so Montana was the most recent one. Just a few weeks ago, the governor of Montana issued an executive memo or order of some kind and waived the ratio requirement uh, for pharmacists as a result of the pandemic. So it's one of these emergency provisions. A number of states have relaxed the, the ratio requirement over the last couple of years in the sense of allowing more techs to work along with a single pharmacist at a given time. So it seems like there's movement towards relaxing those restrictions and maybe maybe we'll see that continue. But it, in general also, this doesn't seem like a, a reform that pharmacists are necessarily opposing. Right. I think in general, it can be liberating in some ways for a pharmacist if they're allowing support staff to take on some of the more routine. Yeah responsibilities. And as pharmacists take on more responsibility, that's more in the actual healthcare provision area, then it might make sense to allow the support staff to take on more of the responsibilities like counting pills and billing operations and those sorts of things. This example of the technician pharmacist ratio, it's really interesting to me because everything that we talked about really comes to light as far as regulations and so on. And here's what I mean by that. As an outsider, I think the regulations are usually, even though I've heard so many things about Washington and attorneys and legislators, politics, all that kind of stuff, you think, okay, well, there there is all that stuff, but they're trying to get to the bottom of something. They're trying to do something that's really good for the general public and so on. But when I hear that ratio, James, as you're talking about that, the ratios of the pharmacist, what floods into me, and I'm I'm coming from both angles. Well, no, I'm coming more as an owner, but what floods into me is just a bunch of economics, the business side of things, because the average independent pharmacy owner, I don't want a ratio on mine. I'll do what's best in my mind for the business, and I know that I can only have so many before I go crazy and I need another pharmacist there to have spread out those questions and all that kind of stuff. So the last thing I really want is a regulation on how many techs there are, where if I was an employee somewhere, I would love to have that ratio. You know, I don't want to be in charge of that many people if it's not going to affect my pocketbook. I want to have more technicians. I also want a regulation on the amount of prescriptions per hour, you know, and all that kind of crap. Yes, 
in the back of my head, I'm thinking customer care and patient care and not overworking a pharmacist and all that kind of stuff. But this is an example where 98% of my thoughts are economic. You know, it's what can I do safe enough where I can be profitable enough and so on, where, you know, maybe 2% is really thinking about the, the actual medicinal, the best for the patient and so on. And maybe it's not that. I try to give my evilness the benefit of the doubt and I maybe raise that percentage too high but basically a ton of it's economic and it's like oh well if every other decision is being made this way too in Washington uh, we might be in a little bit of trouble <laughs> if you're an independent pharmacy I mean the the cost of hiring an additional pharmacist is much higher than the cost of hiring a technician a, phar a licensed pharmacist typically is a, a doctor of pharmacy degree which is years of it's a phd so it's, it's years of training so they're they might be making six figures and then the tech might be making a third of that so you can imagine that if once you hit that ratio that basically you're required to hire another pharmacist at that point if you want to hire any more sports staff so it can really be less about the techs and more about an extra pharmacist right right and so then you might either say well i'm not going to hire anyone else uh in which case you may end up overworking your staff. Yeah. And then burnout can become a concern. Right. Or you have to hire an, a, another pharmacist, um, and that's obviously a major expense. And ultimately, I think we should just ask ourselves, do we trust people to make these kinds of decisions for themselves? Do we trust pharmacists to decide how many technicians they can handle managing at a, at a single time? Do we trust business owners to decide whether they should get another pharmacist or get another technician? Yeah. I understand that there are safety concerns and there's, but we also have regulations in place. We have uh, ethical codes and we have, we have boards of pharmacies that are, uh, that have responsibilities over seeing safety. And, safety without necessarily a number associated with it. Right. We don't necessarily need to micromanage to this level of detail. We can still have a regulatory environment that's working to protect safety and, and maybe does uh, inspections and and uh, and that sort of thing without getting into this level of detail. I remember when I was in Idaho being told that the, one of the regulations they'd gotten rid of was it had mandated that every, every pharmacy have a, a bathroom. Um, now, just the, actually, the pharmacy part like if, as, of the CVS or whatever it is. You can imagine there might be a bathroom somewhere in the CVS, but the pharmacy had to have its own bathroom. You know, it's the kind of thing that could add a few thousand dollars to the cost of building every pharmacy. If you're a plumber or a toilet producer or something like that, maybe you like that regulation. <laughs> it's good for your industry. But adding these additional costs, when you add them rule after rule after rule like this, you can see how eventually you're going to have fewer pharmacies than you would have otherwise. I'd like to say that the free market takes care of a lot of stuff, you know, where if I can't go to the bathroom, I'm not going to work there. And if I'm not going to work there, then they don't need a rule about the bathroom. They'll have to get one before they can find enough pharmacists that will work there that will put up with, you know, not having a bathroom or something like that. But I don't know. That's hard to say. And I say the same thing then about, well, if customers coming in separate subject, but customers will come and complain about something on their insurance that their employer gave to them. And I could use the same logic on that and say, well, you don't need a bunch of rules for insurance for your employers. Just let free market take care of it. If the employers aren't offering enough to the employee, they'll quit and they'll go find another job. And then the employer will have to be faced with finding someone who will live under those rules. And if they can't find anybody, then anyways, that could go on and on. But sometimes as I look at it from an outsider, I might say, well, yeah, but just a few regulations would be nice because that's a pain in the ass to people aren't smart enough for uh, people, not smart enough. People aren't even aware of some clauses and in insurances that you can't expect them to quit a whole job just because of something they don't kind of like. And I can see where regulations might help in those cases because the free market's great. But it just takes a lot of time sometimes and a lot of pain and suffering through people who have had to lose jobs in that where a, a little regulation <laughs> might help. I don't know. No, that's a great point. 
and I, I think it's, it's good to raise that point at some point during our, our conversation because there's absolutely a role for regulation to play in the marketplace. As an economist, I tend to think regulations are needed when there are market failures. There's, mm. there's a failure of the private marker in some capacity. One of those areas is can, can relates to information asymmetry. So if a used car salesman, just as an example, knows that the car he's selling you is a piece of junk, you don't have that information, you're not sure, you think it's worth, it's something better. That, that can be a case where regulation could help improve the situation, maybe certain minimum quality standards are put in place. To have the market take care of itself, you'd have to have the buyer probably buy two cars before he realizes that both are lemons. And then he might have to walk to work and then he might lose his job. And then finally he might realize it's like, I'm not going to buy from that guy anymore. Well, by this time though, years have gone by and the market... It's slow to react, and so let's have some regulations in place. Is that kind of what you're saying about it would take too long for the market to fail? You might expect over time that the, the sleazy used car salesman would develop a bad reputation and all, people would stop going to his business. Uh, word would get around, especially now with Yelp and all these online reviews. It can help spread the word. But yes, there can be absolutely be instances where these problems are systemic, where there are ongoing where maybe the business has a certain amount of market power so people don't have a lot of alternatives uh and then in that case regulation can be required gotcha i think one of the best first questions that a regulatory agency should ask itself before issuing a rule is is there a problem here Hmm. and in fact at the federal level in the executive order that governs the modern regulatory review process, the first principle in it is the regulatory agency should identify the problem that it's trying to solve with regulation. Hmm. And I think you'd be surprised at how often that simple question just sometimes isn't asked. And and maybe a good example is with these ratio requirements. Hmm. So what exactly is the problem that those ratio requirements are intending to address? I mean, in places that don't have them, are we seeing widespread examples of just dozens of yeah, techs right. working uh, with a single pharmacist? It doesn't seem like we're seeing that. Right. So is this really necessary? Is there a problem? There's certainly cases where there is a problem, when there's cases of fraud or there's cases of environmental degradation or cases of um, in the healthcare space, um, people, uh, you know, without certain levels of skill or training, yeah. performing services that they really shouldn't be. So those are those are examples of things where it probably makes sense to have regulations. Yeah. Um, but it's in some of these other areas where maybe it's not it's not obvious that there's a systemic problem or maybe there's an anecdote, one bad thing happened, but is it is this a problem that's happening recurring uh, on a recurring basis or is it just something that got a lot of attention in the news? one week and then the legislature rushed to pass some piece of legislation. That's kind of a common story. And so that can lead to problematic rules. What do you think is going on when there's overregulation? Let's just say that everybody agreed that was overregulated. Why does that happen? Who's to blame for that? I think it happens for multiple reasons. Sometimes it happens because there's somebody who benefits from, from the policy being that way. So we talked about the physicians trying to prevent pharmacists from encroaching in their turf. Right. So there are certainly examples of re- regulations being put in place for that reason. It's Economists call this regulatory capture, mm. or sometimes a, a regulatory agency will regulate for the benefit of the industry rather than for the benefit of the public. Gotcha. That obviously doesn't explain it. All regulations, but it can happen. Let's say you went the other way and you said we're regulating for the public but not for industry. I imagine it's okay to have a mix, right? You'd want it okay for both, not just for the public, but you certainly don't want it just for the industry. Right. So I think every regulation will have coalitions Mm. that form for and against it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and regulations also can create constituencies. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it can be hard to remove regulations, even when mm-hmm. they're obviously problematic. And occupational licensing regulations are a pretty good example of this. Um, so over time, we've seen a proliferation of different industries becoming regulated under occupational licensing regimes, meaning you have to go get a license from the state in order to practice as a plumber or a yeah. carpenter or to cut trees or cut hair, mm-hmm. braid hair in some cases. And be a technician. That's new in Michigan, I know. Mm-hmm. Pharmacy techs are usually licensed, pharmacists. Um, and some of these licenses don't make a lot of sense. Interior designers, yeah. like do we, uh, hair braiders. These are <laughs> barbers. Yeah. Do we necessarily need these right. professions licensed? And if you actually look at what's happened over time, it's usually it's usually the industries themselves that are being licensed that ask for these regulations. Um and one of the reasons they probably do this is because it makes it harder for people to enter that industry and work in that industry. Um, so it acts as a form of protectionism, essentially, for people working in that industry. So there can there can be good reasons to have licenses. Who does that help with over, what do you call it, certificates or licensing? What part of the industry does that help? So there's a, a few different groups. So let's say you need a license to become... A beautician sure and you need to go to a certain number of hours of training at beauty school um, and maybe you need a certain number of hours of experience and pay a certain number of fees so if you have already gone through that process it, that having to go through that creates a, a barrier to a new person who wants to enter that industry so if you're an incumbent in that industry, mm. once you've gone through it, you actually like having that barrier in place because you don't want lots of people coming in and having to compete with you. More of the workers, not so much the owners, right? In that case, yeah, I would say it's the it's the workers in that industry. But sometimes it's one and the same, maybe. The worker is the owner. Sometimes it's one and the same. If you're a carpenter or a construction business, you probably need some kind of license. If you're a construction, for example, you own your own little construction company, you'd rather have a higher barrier of entry from people Mm -hmm. picking up a hammer and saying that they're part of the trade. Exactly. Once you're an incumbent in that industry, you like the license being there because it protects your industry. Sure. What's very common when you see any legislative proposals to relax licensing requirements, not even necessarily eliminate it, but just say that we're going to lower the fees or lower the number of hours of training you need, the industry that's regulated will come out in full force against that change. And the obvious reason is because they don't want more competition in their industry. I see. I gotcha. And that won't be their argument. Yeah. <laughs> They'll say, of course, we need these restrictions because otherwise sure. safety all these and... bad things are going right. to happen. But they also have a financial incentive to argue that. Right. Um, and occupational licensing in general is an area where there's been a lot of research done and the evidence that it improves quality a lot is quite weak to mixed, I would say, but it definitely raises wages and prices that the regulated entities can charge, um, can, can charge to cons- consumers or pay themselves. Um, so there's a financial benefit to the regulated industry. Um, but not always quality improvements. A few years ago in Michigan, they required technicians to be licensed. And I had always found my favorite technicians were college-aged young adults who were go-getters, quick learners, a lot of energy. I just liked that age group. And I could probably pay them a little bit less than someone who was you know, older. As soon as that regulation got in there, my level of employees went down. And I'll say that now because none of them are with me anymore, so I can (laughs) dig at them. But the level went down because I had to hire people who already had it, who were older. They were, I didn't have as big of a pool to get the people from. And the skill level, that much training wasn't needed. I could train them on the job a lot quicker and have good people. So I can see where 
as a industry though, that it gave better job security for people that were already technicians. So the effect that these restrictions have is to reduce the supply of services provided and to raise the, the price of it. And that's now, if that comes along with a quality improvement, then that can well be worth it. But that's, it's, it's pretty clear that that's what, that's the effect. And it's often the intended effect is to um, make, to restrict competition for that industry and to in, increase the, the amount paid. And, one of the reasons it doesn't always benefit quality is that the lack of competitive pressures can lessen the incentive to innovate over time. So if you're not facing competition, um, you might not offer as good a, a, as good a product. I guess to give it fair due, I mean, certainly you want your um, brain surgeons, you know, you want them licensed and certified in that, I suppose, right? When people talk about occupational licensing reform, they're almost never talking about the brain surgeons or the, the physicians or even the pharmacists. It's usually some of these other professions where there's not as clear a health mm. and safety need um, for licensing. And there's, there's also degrees of restriction between no regulation and full licensing. You could require that people have certain kinds of insurance or just that they register with the state. Just register, get their thumbprint, and they've got to do a uh, certain education, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's there's a group called the Institute for Justice, which has something called their inverted pyramid, which is basically shows all the degrees of different requirements you could have with licensing is usually the most stringent. Oh, but there's a lot of degrees between licensing and no regulation. That's interesting. James, is that your wife I see on social a little bit with you? Is she a PhD also? Yeah, uh, she's an economist as well. So that's probably her. Did you guys meet in, in economist school? Uh, we were both PhD students at the time we met. So she went, she got her PhD in Syracuse, New York. I got mine at uh, George Mason University in Virginia. We met at a conference in Fairfax, Virginia. So it was at it was at George Mason. Um, so it was in our little academic kind of bubble, I guess, that we met. I bet the common joke is, well, boy, you you probably have some real interesting conversations, but you probably do. You both enjoy the topic, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't say we sit around and talk a lot about economics. I think enough we both get enough of that during our day to day jobs. But she's a very smart woman and uh she's yeah she's got a lot of interesting thoughts on these topics and i like to listen to them <laughs> what are you both doing in your field 10 years from now similar things as now uh that's a good question so my wife is a consultant she also does a lot of academic research and on the side so i could see her moving more in the research direction potentially she's also very entrepreneurial um so, uh, much more so than me so I, I could see her starting a business or something yeah I mean, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. I really like the working in the policy world. Um, I like having briefings with policymakers and uh, putting out research that's not, that's read by people who can make a difference and not necessarily. I, I publish in academic journals too, but uh, I'll, some of that work can just end up kind of behind a paywall, and the only people that reads it read it are a handful of academics. So. I like having the real world impact. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with doing what I'm doing. It's really enjoyable to have someone on the show like you that I just don't know that world at all. So it's been really fun digging into your mind and seeing how it relates to pharmacy and stuff like that. So I really appreciate your time, James. Well, I appreciate you asking me to be on the show. I, I really like talking about new topics as well and being uh, introduced to the whole world of pharmacy and industry. And I'm, I'm learning a lot of things that I didn't know even a few months ago. So I, I appreciate being asked. Put together a study on how uh, old fat guys should be paid a lot more in the industry. Okay. Huh? I'll wait it. for that one. <laughs> All right, James. Thanks. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.